Well, hello there. Hi. Uh, welcome to another lecture by Professor Wade Bradford. Today I'm going to be talking about descriptive writing, and I'm going to be doing it talking about one of my favorite excerpts from Mark Twain. Uh, this is known as Two Ways of Seeing a River. This is about a 600 to 700 word excerpt from his non-fictional book, Life on the Mississippi, and it's a great example of how we can look at one subject, like a river, and see it in two different ways. It's really kind of a compare and contrast strategy, looking at the, uh, the different ways, the contrasts within one subject. Uh, if you haven't read the essay, I'm going to leave it down below, and I also have an audio version of it that you can, if you would prefer to listen to it instead of read it, or if you want to listen to my narration while you read along, you may do so. But you should read it before I start talking about it, because otherwise most of this stuff won't make that much sense. So one of my favorite aspects of descriptive writing, writing that conjures up images, is that it gives the reader a vicarious experience. If there's a little bit or maybe a lot of description in a page or in a story or in an essay, then the images come to life in my mind. When I say images, in the case of Two Ways of Seeing a River, Mark Twain puts a lot of visual imagery. But imagery can be anything that, that heightens or describes the senses, anything that gives uh, sort of a sensory depiction in the pages. So if you are describing what something sounds like, that's imagery. If you describe in your writing what something smells like or feels like, uh, that's all imagery as well. Any of the five senses uh, is going to be imagery. So the opening lines, uh, to repeat, uh, from Twain are, Now when I had mastered the language of this water and had come to know every trifling feature that bordered the great river as familiarly as I knew the alphabet, I had made a valuable acquisition. But I had lost something too. So with that, you get the topic sentence basically. Now not every paragraph beginning is going to have a topic sentence, but many of them do. In the academic world, almost every opening sentence in a paragraph in the body of an essay is going to be what we call a topic sentence. What is a topic sentence? It's basically the first and or second sentence that lets us know what this paragraph is going to be about. Now, sometimes topic sentences don't exist in a paragraph, and sometimes topic sentences are somewhere in the middle or you find them at the very end, but very often in academic writing, we put them at the beginning of the paragraph within the body so that the reader knows what the purpose of the paragraph is. So with Twain, now Twain is writing in sort of an eloquent, and by our standards today, an antiquated way, but it basically says, hey, when I learned how to do this, when I learned more about mastering being a steamboat pilot on the river, I gained something valuable, but I lost something. So that's the opening, and it makes us wonder, it's like, okay, well, what did you gain, and what did you lose? And right? so it, it, it poses a little bit of a mystery if we're paying attention. What did you gain, and what did you lose, Mark Twain? And then the rest of the paragraphs uh, explore that idea. So a topic sentence gives us basically the point of this section of our essay, the point of the paragraph, or in the case of Twain, the, the point of the next two paragraphs. There's another pair of sentences that I want you to uh, be aware of because it sort of serves the point of descriptive writing in general. Uh, he says, I stood like one bewitched. This is when he's looking at the river when he's a young man, a uh, very innocent, romanticized perspective. I stood like one bewitched. I drank it in, in a speechless rapture. So when he says, I drank it in, right, they, he's looking at the river and he's taking in all of, all of these images, all of these, this, this spectacle of the Mississippi River. And he says that he feels this speechless rapture, but of course what he's doing in, in these sentences is he's giving voice to what he's feeling. So when he says, I drank it in, think of that for yourself. When you are writing something, and this could be something for our semester when you're writing an essay, but it could also be if you were writing creatively. If there's ever a point where you feel the characters want to take something, or you as your own narrator in your own true story, if there's ever a point where it's like you are drinking in your surroundings, you're really absorbing 
taking in your surroundings, that's a great moment to have some descriptive writing. Uh, Twain's descriptive writing in this passage is covering many different little details about the river. Your descriptive writing could follow a similar strategy where you could say, hey, this is an important scene. I'm going to describe everything that's going on in the scene. It's important for the reader to visualize everything that's happening in the setting. Uh, however, you could also decide, like, I just want to focus on one little detail. By the way, you can tell I'm sitting in, in, in a tree swing, and I'm currently in Washington State. I'm visiting my mom, and uh, if you wanted to, uh, to try to describe what you are seeing now, uh, you could just say, well, there's a fool on a swing. Or you could be more like Mark Twain and you could take in everything, all of the, the vegetation that's surrounding me, this tree that's here, describing this old rope. You could describe my clothes. You could talk about the glasses that I'm wearing. You could talk about hair, hair color, eye color, uh, whatever details you wanted to describe. Uh, it might be sort of pointless to try to describe everything. You might instead just want to describe uh, a few things. So it's really up to you. As the writer, you are the painter of words, and you get to decide which images you want to highlight. So if you're writing creatively or if you're writing about your real life experience, you get to pick and choose the details that are going to be important to you and hopefully important to the reader. Here are some of the details that Twain thinks are important. He offers a lot of similes and metaphors in his work. One of the first ones is this sentence, a broad expanse of the river was turned to blood. So blood has its own kind of connotation. It conjures up an, an image of the color of red, probably a deep dark red. Uh, it also can have a creepy connotation or a medical connotation. It depends on what, you know, what your point of view is. Um, so when an author does that, when they say, hey, I want to compare this river to blood, they are making this creative comparison and they are using what we call figurative language. So they're using a, a metaphor if it's going to be something direct. And if you're going to say, oh, that river is like blood or it's as dark as blood or it's the same color as blood, if you use like or as as a writer, then you're using a simile. So simile uses like or as, metaphor just gets to the point and says like, it's a river of blood. He uses a lot of colorful imagery. He says the red hue brightened into gold. He says there's a black and conspicuous solitary log. Uh, the boiling, tumbling rings were as many tinted as an opal. So again, uh, if you are reading this and you have a visual understanding of what an opal is, opals are little sparkly gems, multicolored. And, uh, and so that's going to conjure up this, this image in your mind that is perhaps more powerful than saying there were a lot of different colors on the river water. So when you say, oh, it's as many tinted as an opal, people are going to think in their mind, they're going to think of the river, they're going to you know, think of the image of the opal if they get the context, and, uh, and that's going to create this imaginative experience for the reader where they will understand the feelings, they will understand the speechless rapture that Mark Twain says that he couldn't convey when he was a young man. So one of my favorite passages is when he's bringing all these sort of different, different uh, elements together. He writes, there were graceful curves, reflected images, woody heights, soft distances, and over the whole scene, far and near, the dissolving lights drifted steadily, enriching it every passing moment with new marvels of coloring. We don't have to understand all of those poetic phrases to understand that, oh, we, we get the idea that he is marveled by this sight of the river. When he's, when he's young and he's looking at this river, it's marvelous to him. And that, that sort of avalanche of words uh, helps us understand how he was feeling at the time. So descriptive writing can do that. A good word for you to think about in your writing is tone. Tone basically means the emotional impact of the writing, and that could be the emotions that you are putting onto the page, or it could also be the emotions that you want the reader to feel, and it can be a combination of those things. All right, so what I love about this piece is not just the, the, the poetic beginning, but that it transitions from being very 
poetic, very descriptive, very idealistic, and turns into a very sort of mature, functional, kind of emotionless, or at least a very pragmatic uh, way of looking at the river. Once Mark Twain has experiences on the river, once he uh, starts working on steamboats, then the, the river water, he sees it in a very different way, a very functional way, a very practical way. So he revisits all those images that he described in a very emotional way, a very subjective way. He's now looking at them in a more objective eye, or at least in a more professional eye. So different things that he was describing in a poetic, mysterious, mystical kind of way, uh, he now looks at as, as very functional. So when he talks about the floating log, instead of it being you know something poetic, it just means that the river is rising. The slanting mark means that there's a dangerous bluff reef. Uh, the boiling, tumbling rings in the water means that there's a sandbar that's dissolving underneath the, the waves. Uh, so each aspect that he was looking at as a younger man is now just very functional and it's about how, how do I get my steamboat safely uh, through this river? So the last, uh, the last short section is I think wonderful because he's talking about how he pities doctors. And that might seem at first like a tangent or a non sequitur, but he's really just kind of applying his own experience. He was a young man, a boy looking at the Mississippi and found something that was very magical. And now uh, he's an adult having worked on the river and it's all just very functional, very dry, very, very pragmatic. So doctors, he wonders if they look at a person, do they see some, someone that's beautiful and attractive, or do they just see someone from a business or professional aspect as a doctor, do they just look and, and see, oh, you know, the, the, the blush on their face, that just means that there's, there's disease under there. Uh, so we can think of maybe modern day doctors, uh, plastic surgeons. When I read Twain's work, I wonder, yeah, do plastic surgeons look at someone and think, oh, that person is so beautiful? Or do they look at someone and say like, I could fix that, I could fix that, I could fix that, I could fix that. All right, so your descriptive writing challenge then uh, that I'd like you to, uh, to write it as a journal entry and uh, if you're watching this video and you're one of my students, I'm gonna ask that you put this journal entry in our discussion section. So you'll see on Canvas where you can do that. Uh, if you are just visiting my channel and you want to improve your descriptive writing skills, uh, you are more than welcome to play along. And if you want to leave your description in the comments, you may do so. Or if you wanna send me an email sometime, or you can just write it yourself and you don't need to show me. I, this might be years from now after I posted this. Maybe I'm not even doing YouTube videos. Maybe this is 100 years from now and I'm not on the planet anymore. Anyway, uh, whoever you are, if you would like to do this challenge, here's what you do. You title this journal entry, Two Ways of Seeing, and then you fill in the blank. So Twain writes about two ways of seeing a river. Uh, I want you to think of something where you have two distinct perspectives. Now for Twain, it is the younger versus older, or the inexperienced versus the experienced perspective, and it kind of makes him a bit, if not cynical, at least uh, emotionally detached. If I was going to do this journal writing, and I have done in the past, uh, I would probably choose two ways of seeing Disneyland. When I was a child living here in Washington State, Disneyland was very, very far away, and it was the sort of the mecca of childhood imagination, and I really wanted to go to Disneyland, and at age five I got to go, and it was a magical experience because at age five, I didn't quite know what was, what was real and what was imaginary. So, you know, when Snow White kissed me on the cheek and I was like, yeah, yuck, but I really secretly kind of liked it, uh, I didn't really know, it was like, was that Snow, that, was that really Snow White from the cartoons that I saw? and uh, seeing you know, the characters walk around. And I also remember as a kid being on, uh, on rides like the Pirates of the Caribbean. And I knew because my siblings had told me, it's like, well, these pirates, these are, these are robots. So I knew it's like, these aren't real people running around there, they're robot pirates. But at nighttime, I imagined that these robot pirates were walking around Disneyland. So it was very sort of, very, you know, a magical time, you know, a make-believe kind of time. Uh, when I was 19 years old, I moved away from Washington and went down to California. And one of the first jobs that I, that I got down in Southern California was a job at Disneyland. 
So working at Disneyland was a lot of fun. We were we were cast members there, and um, and I worked in, in attractions. So I was operating the rides like the Matterhorn, all the Fantasyland rides, and it was it was a great deal of fun. But at the same time, you see kind of the behind the scenes aspect. So when I was working on Matterhorn, being trained, and we were walking the track before it was going to be you know turned on for the day. Uh, the the trainer would tell me it's like yep this is, this is where somebody died right here uh, so they would point out like the different places where people died and you realize like ooh it's kind of kind of creepy the thing that that made me sad about working at Disneyland again it was it was pretty happy work experience but the thing that made me sad about it was that I saw how angry dads can get they've traveled thousands of miles they spent thousands of dollars so they are they're dragging their kids around the kids are tired and crying and the dads are just like you're gonna have a good time i paid a lot of money so i want you to be happy so it's not the happiest place on earth for everybody uh and, and you see that when when you work there um so that that would be what i uh, you know i enjoy journaling about sort of the the differences between sort of the magical aspect and the behind the scenes aspect there's good aspects about both of those experiences, but they are different. There's a contrast with those. So uh, you can do something, you know, again, it doesn't have to be childhood. Maybe it's um, two ways of seeing a freeway instead of a river. Uh, what was the freeway experience like for you when you were a 16 or 17 year old driver? And maybe now you're in your early 20s. What's, what's it like, right? So, so some type of transition, that's what we want to explore. Two ways of seeing you fill in the blank. So for my students, I'd like you to try to write at least 500 words and make it at least two paragraphs so that we see two distinct descriptions. Looking at the same thing, describing it in two different ways based upon your changing experience. All right, so that's it for now. I'm gonna go back on this swing and have a good time. I hope that you have fun writing. I'll talk to you soon.